Well, thank you so much for coming out today. This is going to be a fabulous presentation. My name is Julia Deemster. I'm the coordinator of the Chi Center here. The Chi Center is the Community Health Information Center, and it's a partnership between the Teton Wellness Institute and St. John's. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just do a very brief introduction of our speakers today, and then pass the mic over to Mary Gibson Scott. So, um, Kate Wilmot works with Grand Teton National Park. I'm going to let Mary kind of fill in a little bit about Kate's background. But we also have Stephanie Thomas, who is the Executive Director of the Teton County Search and Rescue Foundation, and A.J. Wheeler, who's one of our emergency uh, medicine physicians here at St. John's. He's also a Teton County Search and Rescue member, as is Stephanie. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for having us. Hi, I'm Mary, your superintendent of Grand Teton. And I'm also on your hospital foundation board. Uh, so that's that intersect in this community between trying to make sure that people are safe in the backcountry and also make sure they have a great experience. And so and working very closely with our hospital. So I just wanted to mention that um, the hospital and the community are very dear to me. And that's why I thought we would uh, try and host something like this at the beginning of the season to talk a little bit about living with wildlife, proper behavior in bear country, prepared for back country, travel. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Wilmot, who basically created our Wildlife Brigade, which is our group of volunteers and seasonals and staff that work in the summer um, tirelessly to help prevent uh, incidents between bears, grizzly bears, black bears, and other wildlife um, uh, intersects or interactions with our visitors and making sure that we're all working to protect those species. So Kate has worked in Glacier and in Katmai National Park and Preserve. She has her degree from CU, is that right? And Pardon? Bold, Boulder. Boulder. And so she's our bear management specialist. I'm going to turn it over to Kate. And thanks very much for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for having me here today. So today I'm going to focus on grizzly and black bear population status in this ecosystem. I'm going to go over um, some safety precautions that we would uh, recommend for you when you're hiking in Grand Teton, Yellowstone, or anywhere where there are bears. And then we're going to go over um, some stuff about bear spray. So I didn't want to leave black bears out of this presentation entirely, but I'm really not going to talk about them. Um, we don't know much about them. Uh, we know they're doing very well here in this ecosystem. There are lots of them. They're actually hunted, um, so they're doing well. But I am going to focus on grizzly bear population information since uh, their status has changed quite drastically over the past uh, few decades. For those of you that aren't aware, grizzly bears once roamed from Alaska, the Northern Territories, all the way down into Mexico. Um, because of uh, human expansion, or I should say, um, settlers moving into the west, their range was severely um, declined in, into the blue range there. When Lewis and Clark came through in the 1800s, they estimated that 50,000 grizzly bears ranged from the Great Plains to the Pacific Ocean. Um, what, remain, uh, what remains today in the lower 48 are these five subpopulations, um, and in fact, there's a North Cascades, the Selkirk Cabinet Yak. This is the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, which incorporates Glacier and the Bob Marshall. The Bitterroot, which I don't really think has any grizzly bears. And then here we are down here, the, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Something I want to point out is that we are genetically isolated here. These guys can uh, move up and back and forth between Canada and Alaska, I suppose. Um, but we are genetically isolated here. So in 1975, when the grizzly bears were put on the endangered species list, they estimated that less than 200 bears lived in our ecosystem. Um, today, we estimate conservatively that the grizzly bear population here is roughly 600. So it's, um, recovery has been a success. To look at recovery in our backyard, let's just uh, look at grizzly bear uh, with female, grizzly bear females with cubs in our backyard. In 1980, we didn't have any. None in the, in the Tetons, none in the JDR, all up north. But by 1990, we started to see some evidence um, in the northernmost portion of the park. By 2004, that line dropped to the southern end of Jackson Lake. And lo and behold, by 2008, we had grizzly bears with cubs south of Grand Teton. That's a very quick time period. To look at the success of grizzly bear recovery at a broader scale, at the ecosystem level, 
what I want to show here is these black dots are all grizzly bear locations through 2010. I can't, the yellow line is very hard to see, but that is the grizzly bear distribution map for 2004. Okay, but the dots are all the points where grizzly bears have been located through 2010. If you take those dots and do some statistical analysis, you come up with a polygon, this green polygon, which shows you the current grizzly bear distribution map. It wipes out this yellow line. So this green polygon is a 2010 grizzly bear population um, line. So what does this mean for us living here? Grizzly bears can be found throughout all of Grand Teton National Park, and that's probably the biggest message I want to hit home to you guys. Um, they're no longer just in the northern portion. They are everywhere. They are also in the Snake River Range, the Wyoming Range, the Grobant Range, and the Wind River Range. Uh, so we're going to jump gears now. We're going to talk about some things that we would recommend that you do to stay safe in bear country. And we're going to, we could spend hours on all this, <laughs> so um, we're going to go rather quickly. Um, the first thing is to be alert. When you go out on a hike, um, pay attention to your surroundings. Where are you going? What, um, what type of trail are you going to be on? What's the terrain? Um, we really discourage the use of earbuds because you cannot hear what's going on around you. Um, pay attention to smells. Pay attention to scavengers. Do you see you know, a ton of ra uh, ravens and magpies <coughs> ahead? Do you hear a ton of raven and magpies? Do you smell something foul? Um, pay attention to your surroundings because if there's a carcass, that could attract a bear. Um, we encourage you to make noise when you're hiking. And so that means um, you don't have to scream in the middle of an open meadow, but it's, if you're hiking and you can't see around a corner, if you can't see up a rise, um, if there's a heavy waterfall or um, just thick vegetation, make noise. And we encourage you to use your human voice and get rid of the bear bells and, and forget about the whistle. A bear knows what a human voice is. Um, we encourage you to carry bear spray. Um, but bear spray is not the answer to all your problems if you get into trouble in the backcountry. Um, you have to know how to use it, and you have to know its limitations, and we'll go over bear spray later. Uh, we encourage you to avoid hiking alone and hike in groups of three or more. And the last thing to remember is if you are in a bear encounter, we encourage you not to run. In fact, do not run. It's not encouraging. Do not run. Um, this can provoke a bear to actually attack you if it wasn't going to. It's that predator-prey relationship. So um, it's probably the hardest thing to do if you are in an encounter, but do not run. You will see this sign in Grand Teton and Yellowstone this summer, <coughs> and eventually the Forest Service. This sign is a direct uh, result of the two fatalities in Yellowstone last year. Basically, um, the people that um, were killed didn't have bear spray. They didn't do some of the things that we are trying to get people to do. It's not their fault. We don't blame them. But we as land managers are like, huh, what can we do to do a better job at getting this information out to you? We feel like we're not doing a good job. So um, this sign will be posted approximately 100 yards in on all the trails, roughly. And the point is, is to catch you, you've already read the, the main trailhead sign or not read it. Um, you situate, you got your pack already, your camelbacks already, and boom, we hit you with the sign. And if we can get you to remember those five big bullets, we feel like you're gonna have a great trip. Um, just remember those five bullets. And you don't have to do them all necessarily, like if you don't have bear spray, you're not gonna go back to Jackson to get it. But if you're alert, if you make noise, if you hike in groups, you know, we, we hope that this will help you have a safe trip. Um, there's, so bear, bear encounters, if you're going to hike in the backcountry, you're going to run into a bear at some point. Um, but normally bears are practice avoidance. They avoid each other, they avoid people. You make noise, they'll get out of your way. That's how they, how they operate. But there are times when a bear may approach you when you're in the woods. And it's very important for you to understand why is that bear approaching me. Is it acting defensively? Is it just curious? I mean, who hikes up Lupin and how many times do you see black bears hiking down the trail and they're just curious, they're just staring at you? Um, are they after your food? Are they food conditioned? I can tell you one thing for sure that in Grand Teton and Yellowstone, if we have a food conditioned bear, that bear is taken out of the ecosystem. We do not tolerate those. Or is this bear testing its dominance? Or is it acting predacious? We're gonna focus on these two 
types of encounters because these are the two encounters that um, you need to worry about. A defensive encounter is a result of you surprising a bear. These bears are usually agitated and stressed, and it's clear as day that they're agitated and stressed. They actually perceive you as a threat. I know that's funny because we're the ones that are freaking out, but they are looking at us as a threat. And they want to neutralize that threat. They want that threat to go away. Most of these encounters stop short of any type of contact. Um, there may be some clacking or jaw, some, jaw, um, some huffing, and the bear will run away. Sometimes a bear might actually charge you, um, but stop short of contact, which is why we call it a bluff charge. And usually, these are females defending young or a bear defending a food source. These are the types of bears that you will surprise. And the most serious and fatal grizzly bear attack, attacks are defensive in nature. Okay, so remember that. A predatory encounter is very different. These bears will be intently focused on you, and they are not stressed and they are not agitated. They are calm, cool, and collect. They will approach you confidently, and they will, um, they will be <coughs> persistent. And so what we encourage folks to do in that situation is if you can't tell what's going on, is this bear just trying to use the trail, or is it trying to eat me? Um, so you're hiking down the trail, take a 90 degree turn, and head off into the woods. A couple, you know, 50 to 100 yards. Is that bear still following you? Take another 90 degree turn, and go. You know, another 50 to 100 yards. Is that bear still following you? Do it again. At some point, you're gonna realize, hmm, I might be in trouble here. <laughs> so, I'll give you the tools. <laughs> but most of the time, these bears are not trying to eat you. They're just trying to walk down the trail. You're in their way. Predatory encounters are extremely rare. You have to just know that. They are extremely rare. But most serious and fatal attacks by black, um, by black bears are typically predaceous, which is also very interesting. Um, so when you are in the backcountry and you encounter a bear, it's important to understand why, so your response, I should say, to the bear encounter is, why is this bear acting the way it's acting? What, what's the circumstances that are surrounding this situation? And what is the bear's behavior? Don't be like, oh, it's a grizzly bear, it's trying to kill me, or oh, it's a black bear, it's trying to eat me. You know, don't think about those things. You have to think about what situation am I in? We're gonna watch a video for five and a half minutes because it shows actually actual bears and their behavior and their ears. I can't do that up here. So, um, just, just five and a half minutes. I think it's really worth it. So far, you've seen the different behaviors bears may exhibit around people. Now, let's find out the safest way to respond. What should you do when you see a bear? Always stop, remain calm, and assess the situation. Does the bear know you're there? If not, move away quietly, watching for any change in its behavior. Be careful not to startle it. Shouting at a grizzly that is unaware of you could provoke an attack. Make a wide detour and try to leave undetected. If you see young bears on the ground or in a tree, or you hear bear vocalizations, be extremely cautious and go back the way you came as quietly as possible. If the bear becomes aware of your presence, stay calm and in a non-threatening way, let it know you're human. Talk to it in a low, respectful voice. Wave your arms slowly. Even if it seems unconcerned, never approach a bear. If you crowd it, you might provoke an aggressive response. Instead, walk away slowly, avoiding sudden movements. And don't run. That could trigger a chase. A bear's usual response to detecting a person is to move away. Let it leave. If you must proceed, do so cautiously, making noise as you go. Hey, bear. It's okay, bear. If a bear starts to approach, you're in a more serious situation. Stop and remain calm. Get ready to use any deterrent you may be carrying. Don't run away unless there is a safe place so close 
you're absolutely certain you can reach it before the bear can get to you. Remember, climbing a tree is no guarantee of safety. <laughs> if you're with others, group together. Keep your pack on. It may protect your back and neck. This is when you need to assess the bear's behavior. If you think it's reacting defensively, your goal is to avoid being seen as a threat. Talk to the bear and let it know you mean no harm. A defensive bear is stressed by your presence. When it no longer feels threatened, it may simply retreat. However, a defensive bear might approach you or even charge. If it does, stand your ground. Hey bear. It's okay, bear. Facing a defensive bear can be terrifying, but it's your best strategy. It's okay. Stay there. Most defensive charges stop short. Hey Don't shout or throw anything. Once it knows there's nothing to fear, the bear should calm down and stop its approach. When it's no longer advancing, start slowly moving away still reassuring it in a calm voice. If the bear advances again, stop and stand your ground once more. If the bear doesn't stop and seems intent on attack, use your deterrent. Finally, if a defensive bear attacks, wait as long as you can before it strikes you, then fall to the ground face down with your legs spread slightly. Lock your fingers behind your neck. Protect your face and vital organs. If the bear flips you over, roll back onto your stomach. Don't cry out or fight back. Once a defensive bear no longer thinks you're a threat, it will stop attacking. Lie still and wait for the bear to leave. Moving too soon may provoke another assault. Now that you've seen what to do when a bear approaches in a defensive encounter, let's look at non-defensive approaches. Remember, there are a number of reasons why a bear may make a non-defensive approach. It may be curious or food conditioned. It could be asserting its dominance, or it may see you as potential prey. Whatever its motivation, when a non-defensive bear moves toward you, it will show little stress. And your response needs to be assertive. Stay calm and talk to the bear in a firm voice. Try to move out of its way. It may simply want to continue on its path. However, if the bear follows and stays focused on you, you're in a dangerous situation. It's time to become aggressive. Shout! Stare the bear in the eye. Make yourself appear as large and threatening as possible. Let it know you'll fight if attacked. Stamp your feet and take a step or two towards the bear. Stand on a rock or log. Threaten the bear with anything you can and use your deterrent. If it attacks, fight back with all your might. Use any weapon within reach. At this point, you're dealing with a bear that sees you as prey. Be as aggressive as possible, concentrating on the bear's face, eyes, and nose. Don't give up. You're fighting for your life. Remember, a defensive bear attacks to remove a threat. In a predatory attack, the bear is intent on eating you. In a defensive attack, play dead. In a predatory attack, fight back. There you go. Have fun. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, now that you've learned everything you need to know about what to do in bear country, um, can you guys answer the question that was on the flyer advertising this um, community presentation? What trails do you need bear spray on in Grand Teton National Park? Oh. Yes. All right, good job. Uh, yes, you need bear spray um, basically all over this ecosystem, in my opinion. So let's talk about bear spray. What is bear spray? Um, bear spray is a non-lethal pepper deterrent um, that contains ingredients derived from, um, I can't say the word, capsicum. It's an extreme irritant of the skin, eyes, nose, and lungs of a bear, 
but it also does the same thing to us and other mammals. This is nasty, nasty stuff. Um, the one thing that you need to know about bear spray is, is I worry that there might be copycat things out there, is that it's EPA approved, and at the bottom of your can, it'll have an EPA registration number. Um, it has to be a minimum of 7.9 ounces, and it has to have a minimum of six seconds of spray, and it has to reach a minimum of 25 feet. That's all for a reason, right? It's supposed to stop, um, it's, it also is supposed to say on here, to deter bears from attacking humans. And so it's not pepper mace that you would use on humans. This is bear deterrent spray. Very important that you understand those differences. Um, bear spray is not brains in a can. Just because you have a can of bear spray doesn't mean that everything's great. Um, this stuff takes, um, you gotta know what you're doing with it. And it doesn't mean that you can forget about all the other avoidance behavior you've learned today, making noise, being alert, hiking in groups. Um, you still need to do all those things. This is, uh-oh, I'm in a pinch. I need it. It's very important, important that you read the directions. There are different sized cans and different manufacturers. So there's a 7.9 ounce can and then a 13.4 ounce can. They will have different um, distances they reach, different um, seconds of spray. You need to read your can. You need to make sure that um, what you're dealing with. You also need to make sure that what the expiration date is, it's clearly marked on the bottle. I write mine on the bottom, so when it fades, I can still find it. Um, if it's expired, we recycle it here in Jackson. Um, get yourself a new can. Um, this is my prop now. Um, you need to keep it readily accessible. So bear spray in the back of your pack does you no good. A bear can travel 44 feet per second. Right? That's super fast. You need to have it someplace that you can get to it right away. I'm going to put this thing down. So I try to keep mine in the front of my pack. Um, a lot of people have chest harnesses. It doesn't really matter. You just need to know where it is and you need to get it out quick. This is inert spray, just so you guys know. It's fake. <laughs> so I highly encourage you guys, if you want to be able to use this in a pinch, if you ever need it, you have to practice getting it out. So when you're out there with your friends and family, just pretend there's a bear and see how fast you can get this out. Okay? It's a nerd. It's fake. It's <laughs> keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Because when you're in a pinch, you are going to need to know what you're doing. Your hands aren't going to work. And you don't really have that much time. The only other thing I recommend you practicing to do is um, getting the safety off. A nerd. Go forget it. This, um, I can get it off very quickly, but I've noticed a lot of people have trouble getting it off. So really just practice getting that off on your um, can. You can buy a nerd spray here in town to practice. So again, readily accessible, practice getting it out. Um, okay, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna spray the bear when it's approximately 30 to 60 feet away. The point of this is that the bear is like 100 yards down the trail walking towards you, don't spray your spray. You're using this for a bear that's aggressively coming towards you. You want to spray it, um, clearly pointing it towards the charging bear. Um, you kind of want to point it down. I don't mean down like this, but you don't want to have it point up so the cloud goes up into the air. You want the cloud to go towards the bear so the bear runs into that cloud. We recommend a two to three second burst and then depress and evaluate the situation. The bear will run into that cloud and it will go the other direction or it'll rub, rub its face in the ground, but it'll provide you with time to back away and get out of the situation. Um, it's very important, important that you pay attention to wind direction. If the wind's coming straight at you, you just sprayed yourself and you just incapacitated yourself. This stuff is proven to be effective. It is the only um, studied bear deterrent and it's been peer reviewed. In a study in Alaska, it was found to be 92% effective in stopping unwanted grizzly bear behavior. This is another paper that was done recently about the um, efficacy of firearms in a bear encounter versus bear spray. And I think this is very telling. The yellow bar is bear spray users, and the, fire, or the red bar is firearms users. For those of you that can't see, this is stop charges. Bear spray stops almost 100% of the charges, whereas a gun stops just shy of 60%.
But then look at the human injuries. People who use bear spray, hardly any of them were injured. People who use guns, almost 60% were injured. Almost 50% severely. And then you keep going, over 10% were killed. Look at bears killed. Of course, bears always lose, it seems like, with a gun. So over 60% of the bears in these encounters were killed but with people who use firearms. Can anyone tell me why you think um, bear spray is more effective in these encounters than a firearm? Um, I'd say because most people don't really have the training to use firearms. Exactly. I mean, basically, you have a small little bullet, and you're shooting at a huge moving target, and you're shaking. With bear spray, you don't have to have good aim. You just have to point it forward and aim it towards the bear. It makes this big old cloud. That's why it's effective. You don't have to be a good shot. Uh, let's talk about some safety issues with bear spray. Um, don't store it in your car in the summer because it'll explode. It'll go right through your windshield or get lodged in your roof. You will be very, very sad. <laughs> um, and. So basically, you know, if you're going to go on a hike, grab it, put it on your pack, go for the hike, try to put it back as quickly as possible. A few hours isn't going to kill you, but trust me, it'll explode. Um, and then store it away from pets and children. This stuff is bad. It's really bad stuff. Um, a dog could potentially puncture it by playing with it. Kids could get in big trouble. So store it away from kids and pets. And um, I think with that, I'm done. We'll have plenty of time for questions later. Um, there's two resources I just want to, resources I want to point out. There's a video, you just watched five minutes of it, Staying Safe in Bear Country. You can watch this, you can rent this from the library. And then this is an old version of Bear Attacks, or Causes and Avoidance by Dr. Stephen Herrero. Excellent book if you're interested in learning more about um, bear attacks in North America. talk I'm terrified <laughs> but seriously um, I'm dr. Wheeler I'm uh, one of the emergency room doctors here at st. John's this is uh, Steph with Thomas and she is the executive director of Teton County Search and Rescue um, I'm lucky enough uh, in my extracurricular duties to be able to be on the search and rescue uh, team in Jackson um, we need to bring what I do in the hospital um, out of the hospital um, but I truly hope that I don't ever have to meet any of you um, in that capacity. Me as well. Yeah. <laughs> and if you listen to Kate, then um, hopefully you won't have to come visit me in my official capacity here either. Um, we get to talk about uh, two other topics today. After uh, now that we're all bear prepared, um, we're going to talk about uh, how to be prepared for other things when you head out into the wilderness and into the backcountry. Um, things that you might want to carry with you to stay safe. Um, and then uh, a couple simple things to think about if you do get into trouble in the backcountry um, so that, uh, that you are found uh, faster and uh, able to take care of uh, quicker. Um, first thing that we're going to cover is actually what to, uh, what to carry uh, on a day hike. I'm sorry, I, I talk with my hands a lot, so I'm going to drop this microphone at some point. Um, when you're heading out into the backcountry, um, whether it is an all-day hike, a several-day backpacking trip, um, or even a uh, run up Cache Creek or a mountain bike, I think the most important thing um, when you're thinking about what to carry is, is carry something. Um, you know, it doesn't take much distance um, up Cache Creek or any of our major trail systems. Just hold it a little closer, AJ. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, or up any of our uh, trail systems um, to get to a point where if you injured yourself, even slightly, um, it could take you a long time to get out. Um, and so uh, carrying something tells us that you've at least prepared, you've thought about that, um, and it'll give you something to, uh, to do in those circumstances. Um, what do I carry in my backpack? When I'm going out for a day, um, and it depends on the activity, I always like to carry water. Um, you, know, you never know what's going to happen, how long you might be there if you're injured. Um, and water, something to hydrate with, something to clean a wound with. Um, it can be very versatile, it can cool you down if you get overly hot. Um, and it definitely can keep you from getting sick from drinking from a stream, a, a pool or something else if you are stuck out there and get very, very thirsty. Um, luckily, um, my wife is a perfect example. She likes to go on ultra runs out there and has come back several times telling me she had to drink out of the stream because she ran out of water. Luckily, she hasn't gotten sick. 
Um, I would say with the water bottle as well, fill it up. Don't just fill it up a quarter of the way and say, oh, I'm just going for a short hike or, you know, say you've got a couple sips in there. Just fill it up. If you're going to bring a water bottle anyway, just fill it to the top. Yes, definitely. What else should you have in your pack? Um, a map and compass. Most of us know where we're going, or we think we know where we're going when we head out for a day hike. Um, but how many of us have found ourselves on a trail where we thought we knew it pretty well, and suddenly things didn't look quite right? Hands? Anybody? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> map and compass, I think, are hugely important. Um, the map? Definitely. Absolutely. Um, when you come to Compass, I think you can throw in GPS there, um, that can be interchangeable. But something that's important to remember is um, a Compass or a GPS unit will not help you if you don't know how to use it. Um, so uh, trust me, in Search and Rescue we get the pleasure often of meeting people who have wonderful technology and no idea how to use it. Um, we get calls from people who say, yeah, I've got my GPS, um, how do I get it to tell me where I am? <laughs> um, so definitely, if you have a, uh, a map and you're, uh, you're going to carry a compass, spend some time learning how to use the compass. Um, there's lots of resources out there. You can go online and literally um, tons of tutorials. GPS is a little harder because depending on what model, what unit you're carrying, they have different capabilities. They tell you things in different uh, coordinates. You can have latitude, longitude, UTM coordinates, all kinds of different uh, things that might uh, confuse you if you're not uh, if you're not familiar with your particular unit. So, take the time to actually learn about the equipment that you're going to carry if you're hoping that it'll, it'll help you. Yes, um, I was curious as to whether um, there are free map and compass classes that maybe Search and Rescue offer. Search and Rescue does not offer any free classes. Um, I know that uh, Parks and Rec and some of the other uh, groups in town have at uh, points offered <coughs> classes, but I don't know exactly which ones there might be. All right, so some more things that I carry in my pack. Definitely heading out for the day. Some kind of sun protection. Um, if you're heading up into the mountains and you're going to encounter snow, either in the winter or in the summer, you can very easily get snow blindness. The reflection of the sun off of the, that bright white surface actually can basically sunburn your corneas. Um, you'll be in a very difficult position if you can't open your eyes because they're sunburnt um, and you can't see where you're going and how to get out of there. Um, so sunglasses that have UVA and UVB, UVB protection. Sunscreen. It's also horrible to be halfway through your hike and realize you didn't put on sunscreen, you're already sunburnt and, and you have to go back and there's nothing you can do because you don't have sunscreen with you. Extra food. Um, most of us carry something when we go out on a day hike. I think the important word here is extra. What we're talking about now is preparing for the unexpected. Um, and if you bring with you only the small snack that you were planning on for your three hour day hike, um, and you sprain your ankle and are now going to be taking seven or ten hours to cover that distance, you're going to be very, very hungry. Not only will you be hungry, your body is going to be low on fuel. And how do our bodies heat? They use the calories in our food to create heat. In the mountains, um, you can become hypothermic at any time of year. It doesn't matter if it's July or August, if the day started off hot or cold. All it takes is one quick rain shower and a wind, and you can easily become hypothermic. And so uh, having extra food is important. Um, quick show of hands here. I'm going to give you three options. Um, if you are out in the mountains, you're cold, you're worried about getting hypothermic, and you have these three things with you, I want to know which one you think is going to be the best to keep you from uh, becoming hypothermic. A shot of whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Um, a uh, hot, hot cup of tea, or an ice cold Coca Cola. Let's go with option one whiskey. It would be the most fun for sure. Um, all right, our hot cup of tea. Anybody? Okay, how about our can of Coca Cola? All right, good. Lots of people here. Why the can of Coca Cola? Because it has a lot of calories in it. So we're not going to warm ourselves up. The hot tea will taste great, it'll feel good. But um, it's the calories in that Coke that's going to help uh, replenish our body's fuel and uh, stoke our internal fire. Yeah, but the caffeine will dehydrate you. Uh, it's not going to dehydrate you that much. So, 
All right, so other things to carry uh, to be prepared. Uh, headlamp, some kind of light source. It doesn't have to be a headlamp. If you prefer flashlights, that's fine. Um, I think it's uh, probably better to have some kind of a flashlight or uh, headlamp versus a glow stick. Um, why? Mostly because if you're lost, you want to be able to project light around you and hopefully see your surroundings and, and become unlost. Um, but definitely, if you're out someplace, you could be stuck, you could be benighted. Um, having a headlamp is hu hugely helpful. With the headlamp, make sure there's actually batteries that work in it. <laughs> it tends to happen more than you think that people have the tool, but not the batteries that make it actually work. Yeah, most definitely. I uh, try to make a routine of every year at the beginning of the season, I keep certain things in my pack and I go through and replace uh, all the batteries. And then I take the old ones and I give them to my kids for their toys. Um, but replacing those things, um, I also typically keep uh, something like this as my extra food in my pack all the time and it's great at the end of the season and I get to open up my pack and eat it um, and replace it the next season. Um, wearing extra layers or bringing extra layers. Uh, again, in the summer, you can start off a hike and it can be really hot and warm. Depending on where you're going, if you're up in the park and you go up into the high mountains, the temperature can drop just from gaining altitude. Uh, a little bit of wind and an afternoon thunderstorm, and you can get really cold really fast. Some kind of layer that protects from wind, protects from water, um, and is not cotton. Who knows why we don't want cotton? Yeah, cotton, once it's wet, does not insulate. Um, the synthetic fibers and wool, even though it, it gets wet, will still insulate you and will still help hold body heat. Cotton actually does the opposite effect. If it gets wet, it'll start wicking your heat away from you. So you've heard the adage, cotton kills. Well, it really can in the mountains. Um, so uh, some kind of uh, windbreaker. I add into that some kind of emergency shelter. Um, a mylar blanket's probably the, the minimum. Um, you, know, you can cover with this. You can shed some moisture off with this if it's raining. Um, it can reflect heat back to you and help keep you warm. Um, some people doing longer trips may choose to have a small bivy or something with them. But um, the way I always think about it is if I was out on this hike and suddenly broke my ankle and couldn't go one step further, what would I want? I would want something to cover up with. And so uh, having some kind of emergency shelter, I think, is important. And I usually carry something like that. I also like to carry a, a buff. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's basically just a tube of cloth. You can turn this into a hat. It can be a, a neck gaiter. Um, you can uh, make it a neckband, a headband all kinds of different things, very versatile. And then I carry a, a, a thin hat and glove layer. Again, in the mountains, the weather's unpredictable. Um, and so I try to, uh, try to always have something with me uh, that I can, uh, can uh, uh, layer up with. One other thing that I usually throw in my packs is a SAM splint. Um, of course, I'm a doctor, so I geek out on med medical stuff all the time. But, um, you know, there's few things that are hard to fabricate, and you can make splints out of certain things. It's not that hard, but these are certainly nice. Um, they're also light and fairly flat, and I find that I can put them almost any pack, either in the hydration sleeve or if they've got a frame, uh, a plastic frame, I can put it in there and I essentially forget about it. I don't have to worry about it. All my packs have these in them. And uh, if something happens, then I just have to remember, hey, I, I put one of those SAM splints in there, and I've got that. Where do you pick those up? Uh, you can get those at any of the gear stores in town. Um, okay. Teton Mountaineering, um, Skinny Skis, I'm sure, has those. Um, I think Jack Dennis and some of the other uh, stores uh, carry those as well. Um, something else that I think is important um, when we're talking about being out in the backcountry and potentially um, the things that could happen to us, you could get hurt and be immobile. Um, you could be lost and not know where you are or be able to find other people to help you. And I think a whistle is a very good thing to have. Um, I've actually had several encounters on search and rescue where the only reason we found somebody was because they had a whistle. Um, we've been in situations where we were really, really close to these people. We could not hear them yelling at us. We could not see them. They finally remembered they had a whistle and we found them immediately. Um, pack makers have gotten really smart and they're starting to incorporate emergency whistles into the straps. Um, and so you may have one already on your pack, but if you don't, grab one of the free search and rescue whistles we have up here. <laughs> um, the last thing that I think that you should definitely have with you is some kind of first aid kit. Um, the most common thing that happens to people out in the backcountry is we get minor trauma, cuts, scrapes, bruises, sprains, strains. Most of them are life threatening and can be treated um, and um, you can finish your hike without much problem. 
if you have something to treat with. I'm guilty of this. I went on a trail run, fell, split my thumb open, and I was begging hikers for a Band-Aid. Please, get on the Band-Aid. Um, so as a physician, um, you know, everybody's like, gosh, what do you, what do you carry? What do you recommend? Um, and um, I, I, I got to say that the minimum I recommend would be... Yes. <laughs> So if you have a kit like this, you'll never have a problem in the backcountry that you can't handle. But realistically, um, I know people probably won't, won't carry all of that, and, and I don't carry all of that when I go out. Um, it's hard to answer the question, what should I take um, into the backcountry as, as far as first aid is concerned. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the answer is, it depends. Um, it depends on what you're doing, what's your activity. Um, how far are you going? How many people are going with you? Um, I can give literally um, a whole hour talk uh, or probably a three-day course on putting together appropriate first aid kits. Um, I think, you know, if you're going out on a, uh, a short run, a short hike, something like this can be, can be appropriate. Um, there's plenty of uh, commercial pre-packaged um, things that are easily uh, bought. They come in nice containers. You can throw them in your pack and kind of forget about them. The most important thing to remember with this is when you buy it, open it up and look at what's actually in it. Um, you know, I'm surprised how many people have these in their pack and have no idea what's in them. Or um, throw them in their pack and then never check it again. There are things in here that expire. Medications, things that just get old and grody. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you'll want to replace those periodically. So if you have a commercial kit, actually open it up once a year and look at it and, and see what's in there so that you remember what's in there. You may find that it doesn't have something that you always need, like ibuprofen um, or something like that. So if your kit doesn't happen to have that, then you can replace it. Um, there's lots of different versions. Um, Adventure Medical uh, makes a lot of different uh, versions based on the, the weight, um, which is kind of nice. Um, but again, opening these up, figuring out exactly what's in them. Don't just buy the weekender version because you're going on a three-day backpacking trip. Actually look at it and figure out if it, if it has what, what you want in it. There's also a lot of kits out there that um, that have a lot of the stuff that we already talked about. Um, one thing I didn't mention already was fire, uh, fire starter, something to be able to create, create a fire. It can help keep you warm. It can also help attract attention so that people can find you if you're lost. Um, so survival kits uh, can also be helpful. Um, this is a, a homemade kit that I made um, for a week-long trip that my wife and I took last year. Um, you know, I put the things in here that I thought we would most likely need. Um, you know, it's not foolproof. There are certainly things in here that, uh, or things not in here that I might have wanted, but when I sat down and thought about it, I figured the most likely things we would need would, would be in there. When you put all this stuff together and start looking at your day pack, we call this group of equipment the 10 essentials. I'm, I'm sure everybody's hopefully probably heard that term before. Um, so when you get home today and you're like, what did he say? I should have my pack. You can just Google search 10 essentials and you can find a, 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 almost any backcountry website a list of, of these things um, that, uh, that you should carry in your day pack uh, for safety. The other topic we get to cover today, and very quickly, um, is simple steps um, to help keep you safe or stay safe if you are in a backcountry emergency. So you have your 10 essentials and your bear spray. Hopefully you weren't attacked by a bear. Uh, but some things happen and you're in an emergency situation. You could just be lost. You could be hurt. But what things should you remember? Um, the first thing, I think, is don't panic. Um, or panic, but let yourself do it for a short period of time. Um, so uh, you're going to find at some point you're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You know, I broke my ankle or what happened. If you need to freak out, freak out. Um, and then take a deep breath and say, okay, I'm done with that. What situation am I in? Am I lost? Am I hurt? What can I do? If you've got your 10 essentials, you're going to be okay. Um, one thing that hopefully you did before you left was you told somebody where you were going. Um, I'm uh, very surprised how often we get a call from somebody who says, yeah, my cousin, brother, sister, uncle is missing, I think. They went on a hike, I think, two days ago, maybe. Um, somewhere in Grand Teton National Park or in the surrounding area. Um, and it's amazing um, from our standpoint, then you're like, great, where do we start there? Um, so we start looking for cars and parking lots that have been there overnight and that kind of thing. But anytime you're going out in the backcountry, um, even if you're going with friends, you should let somebody who's not coming with you know where you're going to be. 
know what your itinerary is and your plan, and know when, you're, when you are supposed to be back. Um, and then once you tell them that information, stick to that plan. The other thing that we find often is people say, yeah, they were going this place, and 100 rangers are going up the trail looking for them in one drainage, and they said, you know, I got there, it looks so beautiful on the other side of the valley that I thought, I'd just go check that out. They didn't have the right map or something, and they got lost. So definitely, if you give somebody an itinerary, tell them that you're going to be back at a certain time, um, then uh, stick, stick to that plan. Um, other emergency uh, preparedness things that you can do is, um, it's hard to say this, but carry your cell phone. Um, it's amazing where you can get reception around here. If you have a smartphone, um, you can even sometimes have GPS on there and be able to tell people exactly where you are. I'm lost and, and I'm on my cell phone and I can tell you where I am, which is great for us. Um, the caveat on the uh, cell phone is you, you can't just take your cell phone and think that you're going to get cell service or you're going to be able to use it or that it's going to be the thing that you need. Well, I have a cell phone, so I can just go anywhere because that's not always the case. Yeah, it's not a Swiss Army knife, no. which can't do everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last thing, the last two things um, that I like to uh, remember are as you're hiking, um, we're all engrossed in the beautiful scenery, um, but try to remember to turn around every now and then and look behind you. Um, it helps with your area recognition. And so as you're hiking out, um, if you find that, oh, you know what, I'm kind of lost, maybe I'll just backtrack a little bit, and you turn around and start to see the scenery, and you think, oh yeah, this is familiar, I know that I came this direction, and I recognize that tree and that hill. Um, and that can definitely help you from getting uh, lost and helping you retrace your steps. So just the occasional glance over your shoulder. Besides, even though in front of us looks gorgeous, it's usually just as pretty behind us if we turn, turn around. Um, if you are truly lost, um, and you're not freaking out, Take a moment to sit down, regroup, use your brain, use our 10 essentials, look at the map, formulate a plan. Um, you may be able to sit down and look at the map and figure out where you are. Great plans made, I'm going to go back um, and find where I should be. Um, you may realize that you're really lost and you have no idea where you are. And if that's the case, you have your 10 essentials, stay put. You've told somebody where you are. You've told them that uh, if you don't come back to call search and rescue or somebody, um, and uh, you know that somebody will be looking for you, hopefully. So if that happens, stay where you are. We have several searches a year where we are chasing, literally, people through the mountains. They're heading the wrong direction. They don't know where they're going, and we are trying to catch up to them because they're heading deeper and deeper into the wilderness. Um, so if they would have just stayed where they are, we would have found them within a matter of hours, and they've been home having you know, beer and pizza. So um, definitely, if you are really, really lost, you have no idea where you are, where you can go to get, get back, so just sit tight, make yourself visible, um, make yourself as comfortable as you can with your 10 essentials, um, and know that somebody will come look for you. Let's do questions and answers. Great, okay, yeah. so, um, so we'll both take some questions here, and um, just raise your hand. Pencil and paper. Pencil and paper can be very, very useful. Do you or the park charge people for rescue? And uh, if not, why not? It's uh, uh, not the official policy to charge for every rescue for Teton County Search and Rescue. Um, and we don't do, do that because we don't want to encourage people to not call us, um, which is the general um, feeling from most of the search and rescue community in, in the nation. Um, there have been times when uh, the circumstances have been um, an outlier and the sheriff's department has decided to send a bill to somebody or, or other um, but that is few and far between and those outliers are not for actual rescue volunteer costs it's for the excessive use of a helicopter <coughs> and, and i believe the national park service is um is uh, our tax dollars at work so <laughs> um does search and rescue use thermal imaging to find people no um, there are some flight companies that have night vision goggles that allow them to use the helicopter at night, but it's not thermal imaging to find people um, in the woods. Can you package your uh, your food on the trail so the bears can't smell it in the area and be attracted to you? And if not, how do you balance how much smelly food you take with you uh, with the bear uh, in the area? So the question is, um, how do you package smelly food and can bears smell it? Uh, basically, yeah, bears can smell it. They can smell it through whatever you're packing it in. That's not really a concern for me, to, for you guys. My concern is you cannot leave that food unattended. 
Um, and so there's bear canisters that you can purchase or rent, um, or we give them to people backpacking in the Tetons, where you put your food in there and you secure them and a bear cannot get into them. Um, but you really just cannot leave it unattended and they're not gonna attack you because you have food in your backpack. That's, it's okay. So that's not a typical thing. It's, it's not still a, something pretty, pretty good. Yeah, it's not a, something to worry about because you need to eat. Um, just make sure you never leave it unattended in bear country. Okay, the question is, what do you do if the wind's blowing in your face and you need to use your bear spray? Um, possibly not use it. I mean, it really depends on the situation. I don't know if I could be thinking about those things in a situation where a bear's making 44 feet per second. So um, I think, you know, if you can try to move away or try to move it so that your body's positioned with the wind, but um, yeah, you may, if it's blowing at you, don't use it because you're just going to incapacitate yourself. The other thing is, is, um, and I, is it, you wait until the bear has potentially actually made contact so that you're spraying the bear from that proximity versus waiting for the 30 to 60 feet. Um, and the red bear? Um, from, from hard experience, if you have a cell phone with you, oftentimes in the mountains you can text, but you don't have cell reception. So make sure you know how to text. <coughs> Yes, that's actually a really good point. In fact, search and rescues figured that out, and uh, most of us carry our cell phones on rescues um, because we found that even at points when our radios won't work, we can still text each other. Um, so even if you just have uh, one bar, um, you can usually get a, uh, a text signal through. Oh, you know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that lovely lady in the pink right there. Yeah. <laughs> that question for Kate kind of relates to the good question about the bears. If you don't have bear spray in a Bear encounter, should you ever throw a bear or something? Um, uh, no, but I, I mean, I have to say this uh, no, I mean, basically, because I mean, if you're about to get killed, you got to do what you got to do. So, let me just make sure we understand that. But um, we don't want people to be throwing bears food or backpacks because you may be reading that bear incorrectly, and now you've just taught that bear all I got to do is go boo and everyone throws me their food, and then I have to go kill that bear. And so and that's a real concern of ours um, in, in the backcountry, is that people just don't know what's going on. Um, just that bear using the trail, you know, don't throw them your food. So if you're about to get killed, do what you have to do. Um, you, yes, you in the back. <coughs> what about using your whistle to deter a bear? <coughs> um, we discourage a whistle. Um, human voice is better. Uh, only because um, it knows what a human voice is. A whistle could be perceived as a high-pitched cry of a marmot. It's just annoying. Um, but again, if you're in a situation where that's all you have and you can't use your voice, do what you have to do. Uh, for a multi-day hike, is there any place in town to rent a spot beacon? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know of anybody who's renting the spot beacons at this point, and the reason is um, you have to register those. Um, and uh, I think there's a subscri subscription fee for most of those, which is around $99. Um, and they may have other plans, but uh, those are, when you buy them and then subscribe, they, your personal information is put in there. Um, you can program it to, to send out specific messages um, at different times. There's like a check-in function on some of them that just says, hey, I'm okay. And then there's a function that sends out the all heck signal to everybody and, and their mother in the satellites that says, something's really wrong, please, please come help me. Um, so I don't think anybody's renting them, at least around here, that, I, that I'm aware of. In the back? Thank you. Um, if people are interested in learning more about search and rescue, and I'm um, honored to be on the foundation board, please join us at an open house at a new facility on July 8th from 5 to 7, where you can acquaint yourself with our resources and our rescue volunteers. So mark that on the calendar. And we have two of those spot beacons that we can show you. If you do have cell phones and you're lost, is it just 911? Yes, just call 911 um, and uh, you'll get a 911 operator if you're hurt. Um, our dispatch center is both in Grand Teton and in Jackson use EMD, which is emergency medical dispatching, and so they can actually help uh, direct some basic treatments in the field. Um, and then also they will be getting in touch with all of the search and rescue or um, emergency medicine resources you might need. Where do you recycle expired bear spray? 
Um, you can recycle it at the Grassy Roof Visitor Center in town, just on North Cache, or any of the visitor centers in the park, or at the airport. I don't know if they accept it at the recycling center at this time, um, but <coughs> there's other places. And uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great program. So you said there's uh, roughly 600 grizzly bears in the uh, uh, Yellowstone and Grand Teton area. When, what's the number going to be when we're totally saturated? Um, totally, well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by totally saturated because the population will self-regulate itself. You know, when a population reaches carrying capacity, um, things start to change in how they are structured. And um, so, and things, there's not enough food, bears start killing each other, so. Um, we have a ways to go. We can certainly hold more bears, but um, and we're already seeing like the interior of Yellowstone is showing signs of a density dependent population where there's way more big males, less females, less young. Whereas where we are on the outskirts of that expanding population, we're not seeing quite that kind of dynamic here. We have younger bears, so um, it, it should take care of itself. And plus, we as a land managers have to take care of nuisance bears. So bears that are in basically what's not um, socially acceptable habitat, we end up removing. Bears that get into trouble, you remove. So there's always gonna be that component. Okay. One more, okay. Uh, it's another bear question. Um, we usually hike south of Jackson in the Star Valley area. What's the bear presence in that area, or do you have a feel for that? I couldn't tell from the map. I'm sorry. Um, so you're talking about, um, is that the Wyoming Range? Yes. Yeah, um, there certainly are grizzly bears in the Wyoming Range. Um, basically what I was trying to show in my slides was that they're everywhere. Okay. Um, there may be not as many, but there certainly are bears, bears. in the Wyoming Range. The Wind River Range, uh, the Grovants, the Snake River Range. Are, are, at one other quick question, are grizzlies inherently more aggressive than a black bear? I'm very familiar with black bear because where I grew up, I used to see them all the time. And they would just run off as soon as they saw us. Um, yeah, the data clearly shows that grizzly bears are more dangerous. 